I see uh, uh, quite a lot of new faces. So my name is uh, Father Michael Bakker. I'm the rector of St. Irenaeus Orthodox Theological Institute. And with me are my colleague, Father Johan Lena and Father John Baer, who will be the speaker uh, today. Uh, Father John uh, has a royal chair in humanity at the University of Aberdeen, but he is also a, um, a professor, a full professor uh, at, uh, at Radboud University in Nijmegen, uh, where St. Irenaeus is, uh, is based. Um, he will give a lecture and uh, there's quite a, a big handout. <laughs> Does everybody have a handout? Otherwise, uh, Anna Simon, one of our students, will provide you with, uh, with one. Um, the title, The Great Mystery, We Shall All Be Changed. Okay, Father John, please. Okay, you can all hear me? Yeah, I don't need to talk too loudly. And you all have a copy of the handout? Okay. So I've been working, can we turn it down a little bit? It's, it's echoing. Okay, is that better? You can still hear me, yes? Okay, um, as Father Michael said, I'm a professor at Radboud University and also in Aberdeen. I taught for many years at St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York. Um, and I did my doctoral work with Metropolitan Callistos back in the late 80s, early 90s. And really, if there's one thing I'm really thankful for, for to him is his recommendation that I do my doctoral work on a figure called St. Irenaeus of Lyon, end of the second century. Yeah? I did my doctoral work on that. I've been working forward ever since. I got to the fifth century and then decided I had to go backwards to really understand it, and I've been working backwards. My most recent work was in the 4th century, and I'm now going back to the 2nd century. And I think I'm beginning to understand what I'm reading. Yeah. And part of it is learning to think quite differently than we have tended to think. And so what I'm going to do today is to draw upon the work that, I, that came out earlier this year, I did an edition and translation of a work by Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nyssa, late 4th century. Um, I'm going to tie that together with Irenaeus, but going all the way back to the proclamation of the Gospel with Paul. So I became really fascinated with um, the way that, that Gregory was reading the, um, the, the Apostle Paul, his letter to the Corinthians, and especially chapter 15, which is really one of the great blocks where Paul lays out his teaching. He starts out with, um, I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died in accordance with Scripture, that he was raised in accordance with Scripture. He then goes through and talks about death and resurrection in all sorts of different ways. But then intriguingly, and it never really caught me as much before, he ends up with this first quotation on your sheet. So having gone through all of that, I delivered you as a first importance what I received. Christ died in accordance with Scripture, his raised in accordance with Scripture, all the relationship between life and death and all the other things he does, which we're going to come back to. He then ends up, as if all of that weren't enough, he then ends up by saying, actually, I tell you a mystery. Yeah? And he changes his language. It's no longer just simply, I report to you what I, what I receive, but lo, I tell you a mystery. So he's using mysteriological, hierophantic language. And the mystery is, as it says in the quotation, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So the mystery is not death and resurrection. The mystery is transformation, yeah? of which death and resurrection, yeah, for 99.9% .9 of the whole human race, it will be through death and resurrection. His point is, when the end comes, there'll still be some who are alive. They won't yet have died, but they're not going to miss out. So death and resurrection is a subset of the mystery of transformation. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of the eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable. We shall all be changed. For the perishable must put on imperishability, the mortal must put on immortality, and when the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the word that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
Okay? So it's this mystery of transformation at the end. But to get there, we've got a lot of work to do to get there. Okay? We're not going to get there for another hour or so, but you know, I want to give you a, a teaser, you know, where we're going to be going to get to. To get there, however, I think we need to think about what it means to read Scripture. And I think one of the biggest problems we have, and if you've never heard me talk before, I do like to try and be provocative, okay? so I'm just trying to, trying to push it. One of the biggest problems we've got is we've got a book called the Bible. Okay. which is the invention of the printing press. Yeah? To simply have a book, I mean, not this book, but it could well be a book like that, called the Bible that you could then put in your pocket, hold in a single work, is the invention of the printing press. Yes, there were huge codices back in the 4th century which contained all the books, but they were so expensive to make, it took the emperor to make it, the Codex Vaticanus, the Codex Sinaiticus, those kind of things. It took an emperor and years of work to make one of those. Yeah. Nobody had them, the great churches had them, other people didn't. But we have it, and it's, it's just automatically, we think scripture, we think the Bible, we think the Bible, we think the book we can hold in our hands like that. But all sorts of changes have happened because of that. Most notably, we call it the Bible. Well, the Bible is a singular word, book. Yeah? In Greek, it's tavivlia, the books. So you've really gone from books in the plural to book in the singular. Yeah? Something's happened with that. You know, in the ancient world, to have all the books, you would have had to have a library. You'd have to have a big cupboard full of all the books of Scripture. Now you've got it in one, the book. Something's happened in that. We should think about that. Then more strikingly, we have the books laid out as Old Testament, followed by New Testament. Yeah. And the Old Testament, the Law, the Psalms, and the Prophets, and so on, because it's called Old Testament, we automatically think about it as all the things that happened before Jesus. Yeah, you know, Exodus, exile, temple, destruction, whatever. All of the things that happened before Jesus. And if you want to know about Jesus, you then have to turn to the New Testament. Okay? And when you turn to the New Testament, you then have um, the Gospels, the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, then you have Acts, then you have the letters of Paul, and you've got the odd book called Revelation at the end. And they're laid out for us like that. And so figure one is the mental, my way of visualizing, so I'm going to be doing a lot upon visualization in this talk this afternoon. I've got various images here to help show us what, bring to mind what it is that we're thinking. That, I think, figure one, is the way we automatically think when we think about the Bible. It's laid out for us. Old Testament, creation, fall, flood, Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, exile, all the way through. Then the moment of incarnation. And then begins the New Testament, the birth of Jesus. And then you've got all of that culminating in the cross. He goes back to heaven. He sends down the Spirit at Pentecost. You then got Acts, you then got letters, and then it kind of transitions into church history, which kind of continues on, and so you, you've got the arrows pointing at the end, dot, 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 all the way through to new creation, second coming, and so on. And I think that, that so unconsciously that we adopt that kind of picture when we think about the Bible, and we think that by doing that we're being historical. We're reading the history of Israel, reading the life of Jesus, we're reading the life of the early church, life of the early church continues in whatever, all, all of that. Yeah? But it is not historical. It's absolutely not historical. And what I mean by that is, first of all, calling it Old Testament. Well, Christ called it Scripture. The evangelist called it Scripture. Paul calls it Scripture. The Nicene Creed, when it says in the Nicene Creed, Christ died and rose in accordance with Scripture. And the word Scripture there is not referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's referring to the same Scripture that Christ is talking about or that Paul's talking about. So as soon as we, you know, as soon as we call it Old Testament, we've changed it to no longer being Scripture but Old Testament, all the things that happened before Jesus. Yeah? And, you know, if I wanted to be not provocative this time, but whatever the word would be, if the word scripture is good enough for Christ, for Paul, 
for the evangelist and for the Nicene Creed is probably a good enough term. Yeah? So I really try and urge people, stop calling it Old Testament, start calling it Scripture. So I'm going to, when I talk about Scripture in this, in this talk this afternoon, I am primarily referring to Moses, Psalter, Prophets, all those things. Scripture. Okay? Now, absolutely, those texts were written over however many centuries before Christ. And you can spend your whole life trying to figure out how they were written, when they were written, when they are collected, all those kind of things. But you know, and there are any number of different theories about that. But what is absolutely certain is that those books were there at the time of Christ. However they came to be collected, their books are there. Okay. Now, when Paul was reading those scriptures... What did it lead him? To? Did those scriptures lead him to Christ? I'm going to be asking questions. Did those scriptures lead him to Christ? No. It led him to do what? Persecute Christians. Yeah, he was reading these scriptures. He didn't think he was fallen. He didn't think he was sinful. He didn't think he needed a savior. He was reading these scriptures, and he was convinced that Christians had got it wrong, and he was going to persecute them. Yeah. He then encounters Christ on the road to Damascus. And does anybody remember how Christ confronts him? No. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now just notice that. He doesn't say, why are you persecuting those who believe in me? He says, why are you persecuting me? There's a total identification between Christ and believers. They are his body. Okay, we think it metaphor, but actually, no, why are you persecuting me? All of that. He then converts, you know, blinded, regains his sight, you know, all the things one can say about that. And then he starts reading scripture differently. He then goes back and says, oh, now that's what Isaiah was talking about. That's what Moses was talking about. That's what the narrative about Abraham is talking about, or Adam is talking about. He starts reading it differently. Okay? And then he expresses that in 2 Corinthians. He expresses it in terms of a veil. The veil that Moses wore as he came down the mountain to hide the fading glory, that same veil remains upon Moses when he's read to this day, but in Christ the veil is lifted and we can now see. Yeah? So the text hasn't changed. His way of reading has changed. So what we then got, we've got the scriptures, which are unveiled in the light of Christ's passion, so, just historically speaking, what we've got, we've got the scriptures, we've got Christ and his passion, crucifixion, resurrection, and in the light of that, the veil is lifted and now Paul is reading them differently. Or, another example, on the road to Emmaus. On the road to Emmaus, you know, the disciples had abandoned Christ, they didn't understand the empty tomb, they didn't recognize the risen Lord. It's only when he opens the scriptures that they start to understand, and then the breaking of the bread, and he disappears from sight. Okay? So you've got the scriptures, you've got the unveiling in the light of the passion, you've got the opening of the books in the light of the passion, and then what comes next? You've got the proclamation of the gospel. Okay? So look at quotation number two. This is the way Paul puts it in Romans 16. It doesn't, it's not in all the manuscripts, but it's a very clear statement of this. He says... Now to him who's able to strengthen you according to my gospel in the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the apocalypse of the mystery, which was kept secret for long ages, but is now made manifest and made known through the prophetic writings, according to the command of the eternal God to all the nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore. So the gospel, my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ is an apocalypse of a mystery. Yeah, an apocalypse simply means an unveiling. It's an unveiling of a mystery. It's not what happened next after the Old Testament. It's the unveiling of the mystery, which was kept secret for long ages. Yeah, you know, Paul had been reading the scriptures. He hadn't figured that one out. But it's now the veil is lifted, the apocalypse of the mystery. We can see that they were always talking about this. Uh, the apocalypse of the mystery is kept secret for long ages, but is now made known, uh, made manifest and made known 
through the prophetic writings. Yeah? So it's through those same writings that the gospel is now proclaimed. Okay? The gospel is not another message after the Old Testament. It's an unveiling of what these scriptures had already always been talking about, but not known until it's unveiled. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah? So that then results in the proclamation of the gospel. Paul starts proclaiming the gospel, and the gospel is always proclaimed in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died in accordance with the scriptures, he's raised in accordance with the scriptures. Okay? So from the year 33 onwards, the gospel's being proclaimed through these scriptures. Then you have Paul writing his letters, historically speaking. Paul writes before the gospels are written. Paul writes his letters, like Corinthians, which we, we look, we're thinking about, and, and the other ones. Yeah, where he refers to my gospel, the gospel, don't listen to another gospel. He's referring to all of this. Um, and then you get the gospels that are written. Yeah? Historically, that's the order. Scripture, unveiling, proclamation through these scriptures, proclamation of the gospel, then Paul writing his letters, then the gospels being written. Okay? Although, strictly speaking, I just misspoke. And I'm shocked no one corrected me. I said, the Gospels are written. Is that right or is that wrong? Is it right or is it wrong? How many Gospels do we have? One. Not four. No, we don't have four. We've got one Gospel. Yeah, We've got... In each case, it's the gospel according to. So, passion, opening scriptures, proclamation of the gospel, Paul writes his letters, then you get Matthew or whoever wrote first. This is Matthew's version of the gospel. This is Mark's version of the gospel. There's only one gospel. Matthew, Mark, John, Luke's version of the gospel. Yeah? So, when it says the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what does the word gospel refer to? Good news of what? Of what? Of what? Uh, no, more specific than that. The crucifixion and resurrection. It's a proclamation about the death and resurrection. It's not just good news. Yeah, it's specifically the crucifixion and resurrection. The proclamation. As Paul says, I'm going to preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. I'm going to glory in nothing but the cross. I deliver to you as first importance. Christ died according to the scripture, was raised according to the scripture. That's the heart of it. Yeah? So when it's the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word gospel doesn't mean biography. It means gospel. It means the proclamation of the crucifixion and resurrection, which means that every episode in it is a proclamation of the crucifixion and resurrection. Yeah? Which is actually how we do it. When we read a passage in liturgy, in worship, do we say, this is part of the gospel? But if you want to know the good news, you've got to read to the end. No, we say, this is the gospel. Okay? So, historically, it is opening the scriptures, opening the scripture in light of the Passion, proclamation, Paul's letters, then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's a historical order. Yeah? That's the hermeneutical order in the way it unfolds and is understood. Okay? That is also the liturgical order. Because almost every liturgical tradition reads Scripture, followed by Paul, followed by reading from the Gospel. So if that's the historical order, the hermeneutical order, and the liturgical order... Why would you read it in any other way? Well, the reason I read it in any other way is because we've got this book called the Bible, which kind of forced us to read Old Testament followed by New Testament. Old Testament, all the things that happened before. New Testament, the birth of Jesus followed by you know, four versions of his life, followed by the crucifixion, followed by the book of Acts, followed by the letters. Yeah? So it's changed our way of reading it. And I don't think we can really get to understand early Christian writers unless we start to inhabit the mental space that they were living in, which is not that of figure one. Does that make sense? 
Am I, have, I, have I been clear? Stop me any time with questions, although you have to do the microphone, but well, I, I can repeat the question, don't I? Um, does that make sense? If we're doing the same page, I'm going to take it one step further now. Okay, so rather than thinking in terms of figure one like that, I would suggest we think in terms of figure two. The wider circle is the scriptures. The whole tapestry, the whole mosaic of the scriptures. Irenaeus gives the image of the scriptures as being a mosaic. When you've got the right hypothesis, when you've got the right perspective on it, you can read, you can see the whole of the scripture as a mosaic of the king. If you don't have the right perspective, you end up rearranging the stones, you get a picture of a fox. Yeah? So the whole of the scriptures, Moses and all the prophets were talking about how I had to suffer to enter my glory, as Christ tells it. Yeah? So they're all talking about that. So it's like one big circle, and I put a cross in it like that. Just to, you know, the cross is one which unveils it, and we can see that they're all talking about his passion in that way, crucifixion and resurrection. The smaller circle would be the writings of the New Testament. Yeah? Um, in Irenaeus' words, the writings of the apostles and the evangelists are a recapitulation of Scripture. Okay? Now, I gave a whole lecture one time to students back in, back in America, so it won't, won't apply here, but in America the students came up to me after and said, if only you had used the word recap, we would have known what you were talking about. Yeah? Recapitulation is such a big term and it sounds whatever, all, all the time, but, but everybody knows the word recap. To recap is a summary, yeah? and as a summary it's shorter, and because it's shorter it's clearer, and because it's clearer, it's more effective, it's more powerful. You know, uh, the idea of recapitulation goes back to, uh, it's a rhetorical term to describe the summing up speech which a lawyer would have to give before the court. You give all the evidence, but the evidence is so much and so overwhelming, you get lost in the detail, you can't see the big picture. You have to give a summing up speech which summarizes everything, and because it summarizes everything, it's clearer, it's shorter, it's more powerful, it's more effective. Yeah? In the same kind of way, a smaller circle here, summing up the whole circle, and it actually brings the cross into clearer light. Okay. All that's happening here is, when the disciples were with Christ, did they understand who he was? No. When they saw him on the cross, what did they do? They abandoned him. Yeah? When they saw the empty tomb, what did they say? Oh, he's risen, let's go find him. No, they said, the tomb's empty, what's happened? Has someone stolen the body? Yeah? An empty tomb is ambiguous. What does it mean? Yeah? When they met the risen Lord, did they say, oh, great to see you again? No, they said, who are you? Are you a stranger? Haven't you heard what's been going on? You know, we were following this guy called Jesus, but when he got himself killed and now the tomb's empty, and we've got no idea what's happening. Yeah? It's when he opens the scriptures that they now begin to understand. In other words, all that's happening is they were with him, they didn't get it, how are they going to make sense of what happened? By going to Homer? Or by going to Isaiah? Or going to Exodus? They go back to the scriptures to try and make sense of what had happened, which means that the proclamation about this one and what he's done is always done through these scriptures. Yeah? And therefore, it's a summary of these scriptures. Yeah? Th that's, that's the logic of it. Yeah? And that's the historical order of it. You start with the scriptures, the gospels that we have, the canonical gospels, Paul's canonical letters, are all referring back to the scriptures to make their point. Yeah, the, the, what's reckoned to be the first gospel written, um, Mark, how does it begin? The beginning of the gospel of... Go on. As it says in Isaiah. Yeah, so the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, as it says in Isaiah. So you take you think straight back to Isaiah to, to, to make this proclamation. Yeah? So the scriptures are the material by which they understood who he is. They turn to the scriptures to understand who he is, and they make their proclamation about who he is and what he's done through these scriptures. Thereby distilling it, summarizing it, yeah? in a shorter form. So in the Old Testament scripture, You've got so many different images to help you understand Christ. Abraham and Isaac, Jonah and the whale, the Passover lamb, Exodus, all of these different images. Yeah? 
but you're bringing all of these different images together into a proclamation about this one, and therefore it's a shorter form. Yeah? Totally. Totally. It doesn't. It just makes it... The New Testament... The question was about, does, would I go so far as to say the New Testament doesn't add anything new? All it adds is the presence of the one who's always been spoken about. The, the veil's been lifted, and now we can see, and there he is. Yeah? But they're talking about the same thing. Moses and all the prophets were speaking about how, I had to, how the Son of Man had to suffer to enter into his glory. But we just didn't get it until he did. Yeah? But now that we get it, it's because we're going back to them to understand what he's done. Okay? So this, this, this wider circle, cross, smaller circle, recapitulation. Okay, but there's one further thing in this. What, what we're then talking about, in figure one, the cross is like the midpoint of history. Yeah, you know, and then time continues and all the rest of it. In this way of doing it, the cross is the end of history. It's the end of the scriptures. You're now reading at the end. The, the, the narrative about God has come to an end. Christ has died on the cross, he's risen, beginning a new creation. This is now ended. It's not a midpoint. Okay? Which is why Christ will say on the cross, you know, it's finished. To tell us there, it's brought to completion. Which, you know, there are many other different dimensions of that, but now that the narrative is, is fixed at that point. Um, and it's really interesting, we, we, we will get into this, but is fixed with the death of Christ upon the cross, conquering death by death, which actually is the same end point for each of us. Because where are all our lives going to end? Yes, I mean, simply, we're all going to die, you know. One way or another, we're all gonna, we might perpetuate it. So, so our ends are all coterminous, even if not synchronous. Hopefully you'll die later than I do, but we're going to end up at the same point. Yeah? Okay, so we're now reading from the point of view of the end. Now when you read from the point of view of the end, really strange things start to happen. Okay? Um, the clearest example of this is, and it's something that happens throughout scripture, the clearest example of this is the case of Joseph in Genesis. What happened to Joseph? What happened to Joseph? Pardon? He was sold. I'm, I'm not asking a difficult... I never ask difficult questions, okay? <laughs> the, the only difficulty is that you're, you're, you're looking for a complicated answer. Well, I want a simple answer, okay? Uh, he was sold into slavery. Why? His brothers were jealous. Whatever. All, all of those kind of things. He sold into slavery, yeah? He sent down to Egypt and all the rest of it. The story continues. There's a famine in the land. The brothers then come down into Egypt asking for food, they approach Joseph, they recognize him, they're afraid to approach him. Yeah? And what does Joseph say to them? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay, it's actually um, uh, quotation number three on your sheet, um, on, the, on the top of the second page. Do not, do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here, for God sent me here to preserve life, so it was not you who sent me, but God. Well, which is it? Which is it? Did his brother send him there sinfully, selling him into slavery? Or was it God who sent him? <laughs> it's both, yeah? But it's both on different levels. You can only say God sent him here to preserve life at the end. It wouldn't have worked had um, Isaac said, don't worry, Joseph, God's sending you. It'll work out all fine in the end. Yeah? That would have ruined the narrative, if nothing else. Yeah? So when you read from the point of view of the end, you then get two different levels to the narrative. Yeah? What you thought was going on all the way through, but now you've reached the end, you can see actually something else was going on all the way through. God was working through all of this to send life, to, to preserve life. Yeah? And you can't flatten those into a single narrative. It's two different narratives. 
And I think our problem is we always want to flatten it down to two. What to say, what, 50% him, 50% his brothers, 50% God? No, it's 100% his brothers. They did sell him into slavery sinfully. But the way all things work out, no, God sent him there. It's 100% God. Yeah? Two different ways of looking at it. You, you, you can't square that. Okay? And that happens, it's exactly the same dynamic with regard to um, the preaching about the crucifixion. Quotation number four. This is Peter's speech. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Which is it? Crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men or given up according to the eternal plan of God? Well, it's both, but not at, in the same level. And you actually see the difference in the way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke write the gospel and the way John writes the gospel. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's put to death and the disciples run away in fear. Yeah? And they don't get it till the scriptures are opened at the end. In the Gospel of John, the scriptures are opened at the beginning. In the very opening chapter, after the prologue, you get John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as Jesus is approaching him. Why does John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God, as he sees Jesus approaching him? Is it because he sees a fluffy white animal walking towards him? No. It's because he's already interpreting him in terms of the passion and the scriptures. You then get um, Philip telling Nathaniel, we found the one of whom Moses speaks in the law and the prophets also. Yeah? Already at the beginning, one of the disciples is telling the other one, we found the one of whom Moses is speaking and the prophets also. But then it carries on, Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth. Uh, so they're interpreting it according to scripture, but they haven't quite yet understood. Okay? And then as John continues, everything gets turned around. Um, so although it's behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world atonement when you get to the crucifixion in John there's nothing about sin and atonement it's totally an act of love so it's a movement of love all the way through Jesus says you know uh, John says um, having loved his disciples he loved them to the end greater love has no man than he lays down actively lays down his life for his neighbors his friends yeah? and then that love is traced back to God this is the reason the father loves me because I lay down my life and then love traced back to God himself this is the way God loves the world so John's taken what Matthew Mark and Luke have done but taken it to a higher theological level as it actually not, it's not yes Jesus was put to death by the hands of lawless men clearly you know nails and all the rest of it but actually when we understand who he is and what he's done through the opening of the scriptures properly, Isaiah 53 and so on, we can say, no, this is an act of love, a voluntary act of love. Okay, so again, two different narratives, two different dimensions. You can't, you can't put, put them together simply like that. Okay, now the reason I'm emphasizing that is because we've, if you're reading scripture from the point of view of the end, the scriptures are gathered together and then at the end they're open, we've now got different ways of coordinating it. You've got the beginning, you've got the end. You've got the below, and you've got the above. Yeah? And this is absolutely intrinsic to Paul's proclamation of the gospel, but it's also strikingly that which is prohibited in early rabbinic Judaism. So look at quotation number five from the Mishnah. Here he says, the forbidden degrees may not be expounded before three persons, nor the story of creation before two, nor the chapter of the chariot is equal before one alone, unless he's a sage who understands his own knowledge. Okay, we can, we can ignore all of that. Whoever gives his mind to four things, it were better for him if he had not come into the world. And the four things are specifically what is above, what is below, what is before time, and what will be hereafter. Yeah? So this apocalyptic, this unveiling reading of scripture from the point of view of the end, correlating the beginning and the end, the below and the above, is intrinsic to the proclamation of Christianity, and then Judaism reacts against it. Don't think about the beginning, the end, the above, or below. But it's absolutely intrinsic. 
So quotation number six, going back to Corinthians 15. He says, You foolish man, what you sow does not come to life um, unless it dies. And he carries on with all of that. And then he says, Thus it is written, the first human, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So first Adam and last Adam. Okay? Uh, it's not really living being, it's, it's animated being. It's not, this is RSV translation, I've, I've got to change it for myself next time. It's not the spiritual which is first, but the physical, then the spiritual. The word, Greek word there is not physical, it's psychikos, animated. The first Adam is animated by a breath of life. That's a contrast Paul is making. The first Adam is animated by a breath. The last Adam is a life-giving life spirit. And then the first Adam, the first human was from the earth, a human of dust. The second human is from the heaven. As was a human of dust, so are those of the dust. As is a human of heaven, so are those who are of the heaven. Just as we've borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Lo, I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of night, the last trumpet. So what I did in figure three is to put those terms that he uses onto that correlate. So it's a movement from Adam to Christ. Yeah? It's a movement, as Paul says, Adam is a type of the one to come. Tipos to Melondos. Christ is a reality. And you can play it out any number of ways. Irenaeus speaks about Adam as being an infant. He's just come into existence. He's an infant. Christ is the fullness of the statue of humanity. So it's a movement of growth. Okay? And that movement from left to right, from beginning to end, is simultaneously a movement from earth to heaven. Yeah? From man of earth to man of heaven. But you can't put that in a single image. Yeah? So it's the movement from left to right is also the movement from below to above. Okay? Now, what's really striking, and this, are, are you with me so far? Yeah? Okay. What's really striking in this is that the way that the first Christians reflected on this, with from the movement from Adam to Christ, from earth to heaven, is also the movement of each and every one of our own lives. Yeah? So, look at quotation, uh, we're going to do a couple, of, a couple from Irenaeus, and then we'll turn to Gregor of Nyssa and what, how he does that. So Irenaeus in the second century, then Gregor of Nyssa at the end of the fourth century, just to show you how they're all thinking in this, this kind of way. So Irenaeus at the end of the second, uh, quotation number seven, he says, By this order and such rhythms and such a movement, the created and fashioned human comes to be or becomes in the image and likeness of the uncreated God. The Father planning everything well and commanding, the Son executing and performing, the Spirit nourishing and increasing, the human being making progress day by day and ascending towards perfection, that is approaching the uncreated one, for the uncreated is perfect and this is God. Now it is first necessary for the human being to be created, having been created to increase, having increased to become an adult, having become an adult to multiply having multiplied to become strong, having been strengthened to be glorified, and being glorified to see his master. For God is he who is yet to be seen, the vision of God produces incorruptibility, and incorruptibility renders one close to God. I'd read that passage for 30 years, two or three times a year, and only this past year did, I, did it strike me that he names seven stages. That's why I put the numbers in. Yeah? You know, it's the seven stages of human life. You come into existence, you grow, you become an adult, you multiply, you increase, you go strong, you die. How do I see to be glorified? Uh, to die. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Yes, <laughs> <That's clear. laughs> yes simple as that. The when, he, when he says the glory of God is a living human, you know, you know that statement of his, the glory of God is a living human being. Yeah. Yeah, everybody knows that, mm -hmm. yeah? How does it continue? And the life of the human being is to see God. Uh, yeah, well, what about that? Yeah, because no one can see God and live. No. So the glory of God that's a living human being is a martyr. Mm. Okay? Which is why we only refer to the dead as blessed. Blessed. Okay? 
Um, but it's seven stages. I mean, and the idea of seven stages of human life goes back to Hippocrates, ancient Greek medicine, and all the rest of it. It's everywhere, you know, Shakespeare, the seven stages of human life. It's just such a common way of thinking, seven stages of human life. And he's mapping it out. You know? um, another example is Quidditch number eight. And this is, a th this is two sentences, but the first part is... Where does it, it finish? Yeah. Um, the first six lines, seven lines, is, is the second half of one sentence. Okay? And that's why I had to put some in bold and some in it underlined just to show you how it's coordinated. So what he does here, he says, just as from the beginning of our formation in Adam, the breath of life from God, having been united to the handiwork, animated the human being. Breath animates and showed him to be a rational being. So also, at the end, the word of the Father and the Spirit of God, having become united with the ancient substance of the formation of Adam, rendered the human being living and perfect, bearing the perfect father, father, in order that, just as in the animated we all die, so also in the spiritual we may all be vivified. So he's, he's, he's using Corinthians 15, Genesis 2, which Paul's already doing in Corinthians 15, and contrasting the human from dust is animated with a breath. Well, a breath expires. You know, that's what a breath does. It expires. We might be able to hold on to it for you know, a few more days, but it's going to expire. And as Christ says, if you try and preserve your psyche, your breath, what will happen? You'll, you'll die. Simply, you know, you might be able to hold on for a little bit longer, but he says, if you lose it for my sake, for the kingdom, for the gospel, and so on, you gain it. Actually, in Luke it is, you'll beget life. Because what you're doing now is you're using your inherently mortal breath not to try and preserve your life, but to take up the cross, live for others, and so enter into a manner of living which can't be touched by death, but you've entered into it through death. Okay? So you enter into life through death. Um... So, in order that just in the enemy we all die, so also in the spiritual we may all be vivified. For never at any time did Adam escape the hands of God. You know, we've got this idea of uh, Adam is perfect because we read the Bible rather than Scripture. Um, Adam is perfect, then there's a fall, then there's alienation and separation. That's not the way he's thinking. He's saying, for never at any time did Adam escape the hands of God, to whom the Father speaking said, let us make the human being in our image and, like, and after our likeness. And for this reason, at the end, not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the good pleasure of the Father, his hands perfected a living human being, in order that Adam might become in the image and likeness of God. So Adam becoming the image and likeness of God is at the end, not at the beginning. At the beginning, he's an infant just come into existence. He's got to grow. It's a process of growth. Seven stages. Yeah? At the end, Adam becomes in the image and likeness of God. So it's completely turning our way of reading it round. Yeah? Whereas, you know, we read, the, we, we, we read the Bible. God made everything. Everything's good. We messed up. Whole history of salvation. God has to send Christ to fix it. Christ becomes plan B. Yeah? Whereas, in fact, what we're doing is, in the light of the Scripture, in the light of the Passion, we're opening the scriptures, and now we're reading the relationship between Adam and Christ. And as Paul would say, Adam is a type of the one to come, therefore not the reality. Infant, animated, the reality is here. In Genesis 1, it starts off with God saying, let, let there be light, let there be this, let there be this, all in the imperative. Yeah? Let there be, it is, it's good. Then he changes voice, and he says, let us make the project. It's a project, and it's not complete until Christ is on the cross. Teteliste, it's finished, it's brought to completion. As Pilate says, behold the human being. Christ is the human being in the image of God, which we're striving to become. We're Adam being formed throughout our lives, throughout time, so that at the end, through our death, in conformity to Christ, we can become in the image. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's that, it's that apocalyptic reading. 
It's that apocalyptic reading. Ignatius of Antioch. This is most, most clear to me from Ignatius of Antioch. Um, I speak so much about all of this, I, you know, I don't know who's heard what or whatever. Ignatius of Antioch, on his way to... And how long do we have? As long as we want? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Ignatius of Antioch, in the, in the early 2nd century, Ignatius of Antioch, on his way to Rome, he's, he's taken from Antioch to Rome to be martyred. He's taken by soldiers, under guard, yeah? And he writes a letter to the Christians in Rome and saying, says, whatever you do, don't try and stop my martyrdom. And he says, and now I'm quoting him, he says, birth pangs are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren. Allow me, my brethren. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die by trying to get me out of my martyrdom. Allow me to receive the pure light. When I will have arrived there, I will be a human being. He's not yet born. He's not yet living. He's not yet human. He will be born into life as a human being through taking up the cross and following Christ. In other words, he's radically overturned everything we think about ourselves. We think, of, you know, of course, we were born. Of course we were born. We're living. Of course we're living. We're human, well, aren't we? And he's saying, no. I'm not going to be born into life as a human being to like, die with Christ. So what's going on with that? What's going on with that? Well, let's start. What's the difference between coming into being and being born? In Greek, you've got two words which sound the same, but come from two different verbs. You've got genesis, with one N, which means to come into being. Yeah? Something's made, it's come into being. And you've got genesis, with two Ns, which comes from the verb geneo, to be born. So in Greek, you can play with these words. You can't quite do it in English. But now in English, what's the difference between coming into being and being born? What's the difference? Mm. On the most simple level, really the most simple level, what's the difference between coming into, be into existence and being born? Mm, really? You know, in my street in Aberdeen, somebody just built a house opposite. The house has come into being. The house has, has come to be. Yeah? It's not ex nihilo. The house has come to be. Okay? I put this paper down here. It's come to be on the place. Yeah? We use the word come to be in all sorts of ways. Would I say that the house was born? Look at something really simple. To be born is to be born into life. Would you say the house is living? Probably not. Yeah? Okay, it's come to be, but it's not been born. It's to be born into life. Okay. Um, how many people... You know, we think we're three. How many people here chose to come into being? Did you have any choice about it? You know, your parents have sexual intercourse and boom, there you are. Yeah? You had no choice about it, you're thrown into existence and you're thrown into existence in such a way that whatever you do, what's going to happen? You die. You're as good as dead already. You know, from the first breath onwards, you're going to die. Yeah? So we are dead. It's when we turn that inside out in Christ, by the Spirit, following Christ, taking up the cross, and so on, when we voluntarily embrace that mortality, not to try and preserve my so-called life, which is in fact death, and will just lead me to further death. Yeah? When we embrace that mortality, to no longer live for myself, but to live for Christ, for the kingdom, for the gospel, and all the other kind of things, then I am voluntarily born into life. And that's voluntary, voluntary. And now it's birth into life, a life which comes through death. Yeah? So life and death are not what we think. When Christ says in the gospel, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly, because we think we're already living, we think, great, Christ has come that I might have more of what I've already got. And therefore my bucket list can be ever longer. Be all that I can be. No, if Christ says I've come that you might have life, it's because you don't have it. Yeah? And that's that movement from breath to spirit that Corinthians 15 is playing, that Irenaeus is talking about here. We're animated by a breath. 
but a breath would expire. And we can either kick and scream and say it's not fair, or we can voluntarily embrace that mortality in Christ by the cross and so on, and then voluntarily be born into a life which can't be touched by death, we've entered into it through death. Simple. <laughs> yeah? And then we, so we come into existence with no choice, and we're going to die. Necessity and mortality characterize my existence from the beginning. In Christ, we can turn that necessity and mortality into freedom and love. Voluntarily take up the cross as an act of love towards my neighbor. Changing the ground of my existence from necessity and mortality to freedom and love. As I'm concerned, as far as I was concerned, the cause of my existence was my parents. Obviously. Yeah, you know, they, they caused my existence. But as I continue to grow from Adam to Christ, I come to realize that, in fact, the cause of my existence was not my parents, but God. Because it's God who's called me into being. And when did God call me into being? As Paul's language says, God called me into being before the foundation of the world. Yeah, it gets really interesting now. Yeah, God called me into existence before the foundation of the world, but that doesn't mean that I was hanging around waiting for my parents to have sexual intercourse. Some, yeah, it is. It's, it's a question of order, of order of causality. But I only know that God has called me to being from the foundation of the world when I get to the end. So from the beginning, read the, reading the narrative that way, it's my parents, and I'm growing and breathing and whatever. When I get to the end, as I, as I conform myself to Christ through all of this, I realize, no, in fact, God was the one who called me into existence and has done so before the foundation of the world, before the throwing down of the world. Uh, creation number nine. Uh, he's talking about baptism in this. He says, For we now receive a certain portion of the Spirit towards perfection and preparation for incorruptibility, being slowly accustomed to contain and bear God, which the apostle called a pledge. So we receive a pledge of the Spirit in baptism. That is a part of the honor which God has promised us, saying in the epistle to the Ephesians, in him you also, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believing in him, have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of the promise, which is a pledge of our inheritance. It's not the fullness or the reality. It's a pledge of this. This pledge, therefore, thus dwelling in us, renders us spiritual even now, and the mortal is swallowed up by immortality, if he declares... You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, and the spirit of God dwells in you. And that's not by a casting away of the flesh, but by the communion of the spirit. For those to whom he was writing were not without flesh, but they were those who had received the spirit of God, in whom we cry, Abba, Father. If then, now, having the pledge, we cry, Abba, Father, what shall it be when rising again we behold him face to face, when all the members shall burst forth in an exuberant hymn of exaltation, glorifying him who raised them from the dead and gave them eternal life. If the pledge gathering the human being together into himself makes him now say, Abba, Father, what will the full grace of the Spirit, which will be given to human beings by God, effect? It will render us like unto him and perfect the will of the Father, for it shall make the human being the image and likeness of God. Okay, so baptism is anticipation of that reality which is to come, a pledge of the Spirit, and, and so on. All the things one can say. Yeah? Um, the same goes for Eucharist. Ignatius, when he's writing to the Romans, says, let me go to my martyrdom and I will become the pure bread. To share in the cup of the Lord is to undergo martyrdom. When Christ says, can you drink the cup I'm about to drink, what's he talking about? Pardon? His crucifixion. Is he saying, can you go to a chalice on a Sunday morning? Yes, he is. Because this... Because that is what it means to go to the chalice on a Sunday morning, to be crucified with him, to share in the cup. Yeah? So again, baptism and Eucharist are sacramental anticipations of that end, which is our actual death, our actual entry into the paschal mystery of Christ, which we're anticipating now. Does that make sense? Okay? But one can now take it further. 
what Christians are doing then is anticipating the end which is common to us all. Death is the end of every human being. What we are doing that makes us Christian is we're anticipating the end which is common to everybody. Which is really striking when you think through that. Okay. How are you all doing? Are you ready to shift gears slightly? Okay. Then let me tell you about Greg of Nyssa. So we, we look very, very briefly at what Irenaeus does it and, and that kind of thing, okay? And how he's reading scripture in all those kind of ways. Greg of Nyssa is absolutely fascinating. He wrote this work called On the Human Image of God. And it's a reworking of the Timaeus, Plato's Timaeus, which was the most important work in antiquity of creation and the human place within it. And he, he reworks it. It's got the same kind of structure, three, three different parts of the discourse. In the first 15 chapters of the work, he describes how God is, you know, the world is complete, but there's no one to share it. He's got to introduce a human being. Now that the banquet has been made, he introduces a human being. And then he describes a human being as the apex, the height of all creation. Yeah? He does it in really interesting ways. Um, you know, the very fact that we've got fingers means that our mouth can be adapted for speaking words unlike grazing on grass or gnawing on meat. Yeah? So our body is you know, the, the height of all of that. Um, we're to exercise dominion in the earth, but he points out, we're the weakest of all creatures. So the dominion that we exercise has to be exercised through elicit soliciting cooperation from the rest of creation. Strength in weakness, Pauline model again. Okay? Really interesting stuff going on like that. And then he also describes Moses in Genesis 1 as describing, he says, the philosophy of the soul. Because Moses in Genesis 1, he says, starts off with things, then plants, then animals, then the human being. Okay? So he says, plants, they've got a soul. They're animated. If you've got a rock and a plant, well, they're both matter, but the plant's also got the power of growth and nutrition. It's growing. It's taking nutrients and it's growing. Then you get animals, which have got matter and the power of growth and nutrition and also sense perception. Yeah? And then finally you've got the human being, who's got all of these different levels of the soul, but is now also rational and free will and all those kind of things. So he actually says, nature makes an ascent, ascent going up, by way of steps from the lower form of life to the higher. Okay? So the human being is you know, the, the fullness of all of this. Um, he emphasizes the psychosomatic integrity of the human being. You know, we've got mind, but our minds, he said, would be incommunicable if it weren't for our senses. It's through hearing and speaking that our mind grows. And all that kind of thing. There's all of that. Okay? Really beautiful picture of the human being as the apex of creation, as the image of God and all the rest of it. First 15 chapters. But then he starts off in chapter 16 and says, let's go back to the text again. The text says, the human, God made the human being in his image. And he says, well, look around you. Where do you see that? When you look around you, what you actually see are miserable, suffering people falling sick and dying. How can you possibly say that they're the image of God? Okay, now you've got a further level of problem. Yeah? You know, it's so easy to say human beings in the image of God, but... Have you ever seen the image of God? It's not so easy. And then he says, okay, well, actually, there are two different reasons that are going on for this. First of all, male and female. Male and female is a departure from the prototype because in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female. So there's already a departure going on here. What's going on with that? And he plays around. He's, really, he's a really clever writer. He actually says, when he starts talking about this, he says, I'm not going to tell you what I think about this. I'm going to give you exercises to work on. Yeah? And so he's deliberately exercising the reader so it, to purify their mind. Maybe sexuality, being male and female, is not what we think it's about. Okay? He plays with all of that. And then the second reason he gives is quotation number 10. And this is mind-blowing, really mind-blowing. He says, 
Now, just as any human being is encompassed by his bodily dimension, to be a human being, you've got to be specific, you've got to have a delineation, you've got to have a shape, yeah? The bodily dimensions. And his magnitude, and his magnitude commensurate with the appearance of the body, is a measure of his subsistence. So also, I think, that the entire plenitude of humanity was included by the God of all, by the power of his foreknowledge, as one body. And that this is what the account teaches, saying that, and God made the human being in accordance with the image of God, made he him. The human being manifested together with the first formation of the world, and he who shall come to be after the consummation of all, both likewise have this. Notice the vocabulary he uses. The human being manifested, shown in Genesis 1. Yeah, described. God made the human being his image. And he who shall come to be, the coming to be is at the end. It's shown, but it comes to be at the end. Both likewise have this. They equally bear in themselves the divine image. For this reason, the whole was called one human being. Because to the power of God, nothing is either past or is to come, but even that which is looked for is embraced equally as a present by his all-embracing activity. The whole nature then, extending from the first to the last, is a kind of single image of he who is. In other words, the whole of humanity from the beginning of time to the end constitutes the one human being that is the image of God. Remember the time we saw in Irenaeus? You know, for this reason, at the end, Adam becomes. Was Adam the name of humanity as a whole or a single human being? Yeah, it could be both, obviously. So here it is. The whole of humanity from beginning to end is a single image of, the, of he who is. You know, it might strike us odd to think that there's a fixed number of human beings because we've just got this myth of eternal growth and all the rest of it. But the reality is the world will come to an end at a certain point. The world will come to an end. Everything that comes into being is going to pass away. It will come to an end. And if it comes to an end, well, that's the end of the multiplication of human beings. There's a, fi there's a fixed number. God sees all of this. God's outside of time. God creates instantaneously, but it takes time to unfold. So God, by his power for knowledge, creates the human being in his image as a single human being, but it takes time to unfold all of that through multiplication. Yeah? So we're in the midst of that, and so we cannot yet see the human being as the image of God because we're not at the end. Okay? Now that then gives further dimension to the existence of male and female. Male and female is not simply about having sexual pleasure or whatever, 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 or making a family that can look after me in my old age, self-preservation or the continuation of the human race. Male and female and procreation is about building up the body of Christ. Because we won't get there until we get to the end. Yeah? So von Balthasar puts it most neatly. He says, the whole Adam is the whole Christ. Seen from the beginning and seen from the end. Really wild. Really wild. And then he carries on, quotation number 11. He says, With the plenitude of human beings then, preconceived by the activity of foreknowledge, coming into life by means of this more animal form of birth, sexual reproduction, God, who guides all things in a certain order and sequence, since the inclination of our nature to what is lowly, we, we tend towards that which is lowly, which he who beholds equally with the present what is to happen before it happens. He made this form of birth absolutely necessary for humanity. God therefore knew the time coextensive with the formation of human beings, so that the extent of time should be adapted for the entrance of the predetermined souls, and that the flowing movement of time should then halt when humanity is no longer produced for it. And when the genesis of human beings is completed, time should stop together with the end of it. And then should take place a reconstitution of all. With the changing of the whole, humanity should be changed from the corruptible to earthly, the impassable to the eternal. This, it seems to me, is what the divine apostle was considering when he foretold in the epistle to the Corinthians the sudden stoppage of time and the deliverance of moving things into the opposite state. When he says... Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For when, I suppose, the plenitude of human nature has arrived at the limit, in accordance with the foreknown measure, because there's nothing wanting in terms of growth in the number of souls, he taught the change of beings will take place in an instant of time, calling that t limit of time which has no parts for extension of moment and the twinkling of an eye, so that it will no longer be possible for one who's set foot upon the last and extreme edge of time, for nothing is lacking in that extremity, to obtain this circling change by death. But only when the trumpet of the resurrection sounds, awaking the dead and transforming those who remain in life, according to the likeness of those who have undergone this change to the resurrection at once to incorruptibility, so that the weight of the flesh no longer weighs downwards, nor does the burden hold them to the earth, they arise aloft through the air, we shall be caught up into clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Really beautiful description of all of this. <coughs> okay, but now what gets really wild is he's described two different analyses. He's described, if you like, the evolution of nature from the lower forms of life to the higher, culminating in the human being, this progress of the levels of soul. He's described the progress from Adam to Christ, that whole movement of the, of the, the increase of the human race. But then both of these are there to explain what happens in each of our lives. So the whole last part of the work is devoted to a heavily detailed anatomical ancient medical discussion of conception, growth, bodily limbs, how your ki kidney relates to your spleen, and oh, a whole bunch of different things. Yeah? Really, really medical in terms of his day. But the movement is the same. So quotation number 12. For just as a body proceeds from a very small original to a perfect state, so also the activity of the soul growing in step with the subject gains and increases with it. So we grow in body and soul. Our life is one of growth. In its first formation, first of all comes the power of growth and nourishment alone, as though, as though some root buried in the ground. For the smallness of the one receiving does not admit of more. So, you know, we come into existence, not birth, we come into existence by a seed being deposited in the womb, and in the womb, growing. This ancient medical knowledge may have been limited, but basically, we come into, the, into existence as a seed in the womb, growing by the power of growth and nutrition. Growing in body and soul by the power of growth and nutrition. Then as a plant comes to light, and shows its shoot to the sun, its, its root to the sun, the gift of sense perception blossoms. So when the fetus is big enough, it comes out into the world, opens its eyes, and now grows, continues to grow by growth and nutrition, body and soul, but is also growing through sense perception. It can see, it can hear, it can talk, its rational faculty can start developing. Continued growth. And when at last it's ripened and has grown to its proper height, the rational faculty begins to shine, just like some fruit, not appearing all at once. You know, I've never met a six-month-old or even a toddler who's a perfectly rational being. It takes time, you know, not all at once, but by diligence growing with the perfection of the instrument, always bearing as much fruit as the power of the subject grants. So it's a pattern of growth. We're back to the image of growth all the way through with all of this. Okay, you with me so far? That's where he more or less ends his work. And then he, he finished by saying, so let's put off the old man and put on the new. Okay? Now, I want to address a further question, and then we're going to come back to that final transformation and end with that. The further question is, where is time in all of this? Yeah? So, you know, in the first figure that we had, you've got a line of time. This happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Very straightforward, yeah? And it's, and it's all in the past. I suggest you shouldn't think like that. You should think in terms of that circle, the whole image of Christ. So where is time in that? Um, I think in order to, to really get this, um, we need to reorient ourselves with regard to how we're thinking about that and look at figure four. Now figure four is my attempt, and it's still not adequate, I'm still working on it, my attempt to do, to to, describe, to, to show what actually is involved in reading scripture. We tend to think of time as being you know, what happened in the past, all these things that happened in the past. But actually, 
I meant to say, you know, we're the ones standing at the apex here. Yeah, we're the ones standing at the apex. We're standing at the foot of the cross. Yeah, that's what I tried to do by the different shading. We're standing at the foot of the cross. And we're the ones who are reading from Adam to Christ. Yeah? The time of Scripture is not, I don't know, 10,000 BC to 30 AD. The time of Scripture is the time it takes me to read Genesis to Apocalypse. Yeah, it's a time in the present, times it takes me. Okay? Now, we've got so habituated to thinking of time as being movement along a line. You know, I'm here, my parents are here, my grandparents are here, my children will be here, time along the line. But there is no line. How long have we been sitting here? An hour and a half already, gosh. An hour and a half. Have we moved? Yeah? You know, we haven't moved along a line. If there's been movement, it's movement in our growth of understanding. So time is a measurement of growth, not of spatial movement. Okay? We're standing still, we're reading from Genesis to, from Adam to Christ, and in that movement of reading from Adam to Christ, we're growing from Adam to Christ. So one of the most sophisticated philosophers of antiquity, Plotinus, he describes it like this. He says, time is the life of the soul in its changing motion from one way of living to another. Time is the changing motion of the soul. Uh, the life of the soul is changing motion from one way of living to another. Time is the movement from breath to spirit, from Adam to Christ, which is my growth from conception, fetus, toddler, adult, my growth, yeah, in which I'm staying in the same spot. Okay? And that's really interesting to kind of correlate that. We've we still got a Newtonian understanding of space and time. You know, time is a, a measurement of a lot, a lot of space and geometricized time and so on. But actually, contemporary physics wouldn't do it like that. So this, this book by Carlo Rovelli, which is fascinating, he says, heat cannot pass from a cold body to a hot one. Second law of thermodynamics. You cannot transfer heat from a cold body to a hot body. To a cold body yeah? This is the only basic law of physics that distinguishes the past from the future. The link between time and heat is therefore fundamental. Every time a difference is manifest between the past and the future, heat or the transfer of heat is involved. Yeah, from the point of view of physics, time is completely reversible. The only thing which is non-reversible is transfer of heat. You cannot transfer heat from a cold body to a hot body. So if time is to be thought of as a changing motion of life from one form to another, from breath to spirit, well, what does Christ do? He ascends to... He, 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 he says, you know, I've come to throw fire upon the earth. What happens when his disciples start to realize who he is in, in, in their encounter with the risen Christ? Their hearts start to burn within them. When Christ ascends to heaven and sends the Spirit, how does he send it? In flames of fire. So you've got this language, really intrinsic to Scripture. Yeah, Origen goes through the whole of Scripture and points out every time God is spoken of, it's in terms of heat. Every time the devil is spoken of, it's in terms of cold. And that's still in our language, at least uh, I assume in Dutch. Warm-hearted, cold-hearted. You know, it's, it's, it's intrinsic to our language. So Christ has come to throw fire upon the earth, to kindle us, so that we can grow in the spirit. I mean, it's modern physics. There we go. Who knew? Okay, now with that in mind, um, does that diagram kind of make sense? You know, we're the ones standing, we're reading from from Genesis onwards, yeah? And we are growing as we're reading. And we continue to grow throughout the course of our life. Okay, now, what then about that final transformation? We've spoken about martyrdom, death, life, and those kind of things. We've spoken about the double narrative of all of this. We've spoken about how, yes, it says God made a human being, but when you look around, do you, God made a human being in his image, but when you look around, do you see that? 
God made everything and everything is good, but what we see when we look around us is catastrophe. People killing each other, people starving, all of that. You know, it's just horrific on one level. It's absolutely horrific and it's just getting worse day by day. Okay? But what we're now able to do is to look at all of this and see it as birth pangs. And Paul already does that in Romans 8. Quotation number 16. He says, I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. The creation itself will be set free from bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail until now. Not only creation, but we ourselves are the first fruits of the Spirit. We grow inwardly as we await for the adoption of sons, redemption of our body. So the whole of creation for Paul is seen as a womb in which we are still growing. Yeah? Um, we're growing and the whole, the whole of creation is in travail awaiting the revelation of the sons of God. And it's exactly that language which Gregory then adopts. We grew in the womb by the power of growth and nutrition until we're big enough to come out into the world as we know it. But this world is also a womb in which we keep on growing and we're not there yet. Death and resurrection, the transformation is the final end of all of that. So, quotation number seven, 17. Um, he's writing to those, to those, about those who have fallen asleep. And he's writing especially with regard to those people who think that those who have died are the unfortunate ones. They're unfortunate because they've got no longer all the benefits of this life and all the enjoyment, food, drink, and whatever. Yeah? We think that they're unhappy. And he turns it round and says, 17, In just the same way, those who are displeased by the change of life, by the change from the present life, seem to me to experience the suffering of embryos want, by wanting to live their lives at all times in the place of this material odiousness. For since the birth pangs of death serve as the midwife assisting the birth of humans to another life, when they go forth to that light and draw in the pure spirit, they, who've gone through that, know by experience what a great difference is between that life and the present one. While those left behind in this moist and flabby life, since they are simply embryos and not humans. Yeah? We're not yet human, we're embryos. We haven't yet reached that stage. Yeah? Um, where simply embryos are not humans, they th those people call a person departing from them from the affliction that surrounds us now unhappy as though they were living some good. They do not know that just as the newborn infant, an eye is open for him when he leaves what now afflicts him. So, you know, we're not there yet. We're still growing. We're still growing, a growth which, because we've come into existence, will necessarily end in death, but the death now becomes birth into life, a life as a human being. Um, a few more quotations of Gregory, one from Maximus, and we'll finish. So he carries on. Nature always trains us by death, and death has been made to grow together with life as it passes through time. For since life is always moved from the past to the future and never does away with what follows afterwards, death is what always accompanies the life-giving activity by being united with it. For in past times, every life-giving movement and activity certainly ceases. Since then, impotence and inactivity are the special property of death, and certainly this always follows after the life-giving activity. It's not outside the truth to say that death has been woven together with life. That is why, according to the words of the great Paul, we die daily. Not remaining the same in the same house of the body, but from time to time we become different from something else by addition and subtraction, by being constantly changed as though to a new body. Why then are we astonished at death? when the life existing through the flesh has been demonstrated, life has demonstrated to be its constant care and its training ground. Okay? You know, 
Life has been woven together with death. We're training in all of this. We're taking up the cross. We're anticipating the end which is coming to all so that we can be born into life, that final stage of growth, and finally become human. With regard to what our bodies will be like then, quotation number 19, you know, now we know ourselves as male and female, sexual existence, but in Christ it's neither male nor female. How should we then understand that? Well, he carries on quotation number 19. He points out that Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says, we've got a house not made by hands, eternal in the heavens, and says, let no one describe to me the mark, shape, and form of that house not made by hands, according, don't try and describe it, according to the likeness of the characteristic marks that now appear to us and that distinguished us one from another by special properties. For it's not only the resurrection that's been preached to us by the divine oracles, but also those who are being renewed by the resurrection pledged by the divine scripture must be changed. Back to my starting verse. We must be changed. Given that we must be changed, it is entirely necessary that what we shall be changed to has been hidden from absolutely everyone and is unknown because no example of what is hoped is to be seen in the life we now live. Yeah? It's beyond. Okay? So don't even think about it. There's always continuity, but there's always discontinuity as well. A seed falls in the ground, it grows to become a plant. There's continuity between a seed and a plant, but you can't describe the plant by describing the seed. There's radical discontinuity as well. Okay, one final quotation to show that this image of womb, this world as a womb, is you know, not unique, but it's pervasive. Quotation number 20 from Maximus. For it's true, though it may be a jarring and unusual thing to say, that both we and the Word of God, the Creator and Master of the universe, have, exist in a kind of womb owing to the present conditions of our life. In this sense-perceptible world, just as if you were enclosed in a womb, the word of God appears only obscurely and only to those of the spirit of John the Baptist. Well, on the other hand, human beings gazing through the womb of the material world catch but a glimpse of the word who is concealed within beings. And this, again, only if they are endowed with John's spiritual gifts. For when compared to the ineffable glory and splendor of the age to come and to the kind of life that awaits us there, this present life differs in no way from a womb swathed in darkness in which, for the sake of us who are infantile in mind, the infinitely perfect word of God who loves mankind became an infant. Really beautiful language. Became an infant for us who are infants so that he might grow with us through death and resurrection to be transformed to be his body. Okay, and then finally, just to wrap it all up, this quotation from Dostoevsky. The conclusion really would be, clearly we are transitory beings and our existence on earth is clearly a process, the uninterrupted existence of a chrysalis transitioning into a butterfly. Yeah? It's a radically different way of understanding and presenting the Christian faith than we've become used to, bound up with a very different way of reading scripture as scripture rather than Bible and all of that. And it enables us to see the movement from Adam to Christ, the movement of the beginning of the world to the end of the world, and the movement of each of our lives, conception in the womb, growing, coming out, ending in death, but by virtue of Christ to death, which is now transformation, as in some ways actually being the same movement all the way through the same movement, growth into maturity, growth through all the different stages we've been talking about, and a growth which, the final stage of which is death, Christ's death on the cross being the end, but all of our ends being coterminous with his end. Okay? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Father, uh, Father John. Uh, as you notice, the Orthodox, they have a, a different conception of time, <laughs> also for, <laughs> for lectures. Uh, we are blessed to, to, uh, to listen to your lectures. Every time, it's like reading scripture, I hear something new. 